Welcome to Insights and Sound, where we talk to the people behind the scenes, behind the technology, and behind the music. People you may not know, but you should. My guest today is producer Shell Talmy. Shell's uh, discography includes some of the uh, some of the early works from The Who, um, a majority of works from The Kinks, The Easy Beats. Tons of other stuff from the 1960s and uh, I guess early 70s as well. Right, correct. And um, so I'd, I'd like to start with just a little bit of info on your musical background because I know you are you obviously came to this through being a musician as most of us did, but you kind of veered off on another path. So what what was your early musical background? Well, I, actually, I. I <laughs> Uh, I do not consider myself a musician, albeit that I play guitar, but I'm a good enough producer, so I wouldn't want to produce myself in, on guitar. Uh, yes, I can read music, and yes, I can play adequately. That's about the size of it. Uh, I mainly started doing percussion for fun. It was my kind of Hitchcock appearance. Um, but uh, my main... Uh, entry into the music biz was as a re recording engineer. So you were dr more drawn to the technical stuff right away? Yeah, I think so. Well, it also was a matter of opportunity. I was offered the um, opportunity of becoming a recording engineer by Phil Yens, who owned Conway Studios here in uh, L.A. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> I had just quit working for ABC Television because... Um, I was really bummed out with the politics and went on with um, trying to get on as a, as a, just as a, as a person in the business. And um, anyways, I, I met Phil at the local music hangout, which was Martoni's here in L.A. And as you have lived in L.A. for a long time, you probably know of Martoni's, even if it was a bit early for you. Um, Indeed, legendary. And... and uh, Phil and I got on, get along great, and uh, he offered to teach me how to be a recording engineer. I said, terrific, I'll do it. And uh, we're talking now about early equipment, maybe uh, prehistoric by some measure. And, the old uh, bake light knobs and stuff? I, oh, yeah, we had yeah, we had rotary knobs on, on the original console that I was working with. And... Uh, uh, three days later, I did my first solo session, which was a nail biter to say the least, <laughs> uh, and went on from there. Interesting. So you, so you really kind of merged the whole left brain and right brain thing pretty early on in your career. Then, well, I've always been interested in both sides of the brain. I am, in fact, left-handed, so yeah, we are the only ones in our, mm -hmm. our right minds, as you know. And, <laughs> yep. Um, yep. Uh, but I am fairly ambidextrous also. So uh, it was pretty easy, and I've always been interested in the science aspect of things anyhow. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's kind of cool. I mean, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of divergence there between people who can sort of understand all of that technical aspect of it, but people who can also intuit the creative side of it, you know, and that's always fascinated me. Well, I, <clears throat> I think I discovered early on just by, listening to the radio a lot when I was you know, an early teen, that uh, what if, for whatever reason, um, I was pretty good at picking what, was, uh, what would be a hit and what would be a hit song. And that has really carried on through my entire career. Yeah, clearly you've had some pretty good, uh, some pretty good instincts there, no question. Mm -hmm. So let's get into a little bit of your your basic background for folks that don't know of your early work. I know that um, you you have a great saga of how you um, you were basically working at Conway, I guess, or working within. You were working in L.A. and I guess you uh, you took a little trip to the U.K. intending on it being a couple of weeks, and it ended up being um, a little bit longer than that. Tell us about that. Well, uh, Conway, as I said, was owned by Phil Yen, who was English. And he kept extolling the virtues of England. And I thought, okay, what the hell? I'm like, you know, 22 or something. Um, I uh, thought it'd be nice if I made a trip to London. 
for about five weeks, and I could then take a trip to Paris and all that kind of stuff, and see you know uh, what was happening elsewhere before life passed me by. So um, uh, I was allegedly going to I was back planning exactly going for five weeks. I, I had a I had been given a situation here with Era Records. They wanted a four single deal, which was a big deal at that time. Uh, as a producer, that is. And um, so I said, I'll be back in five weeks. And of course, 17 years later, that's when I finally got back. Uh, I, uh, the, the, base, the bottom line story is I went, I, I was going with very little money. And um, I thought if I could work for a couple of weeks doing something to add to my meager coffers, then um, I'd be a happy camper. So um, I asked around about uh, from people, my friends in the biz here in uh, LA about who I could talk to in London, you know, that might get me an appointment with uh, one of the records companies. And uh, then my, uh, my good friend, Nick Finney, who was Capital Records a and I told him I was going and I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell him I'm a producer, not an engineer. And he said, here's a couple of my acetates, take them with you and uh, you can, you know, uh, you can tell them that you, you did them, that, 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 that that'll help. And, you know, fortunately, uh, they did help because one of them was uh, the Beach Boys Serpent Safari and the other one was uh, Music in the Air by Lou Rawls. So uh, uh, that kind of um, uh, showed what I allegedly could do. <laughs> It's kind of walking in with carte blanche right there, oh, isn't it? Really, yeah. <laughs> so and I got to London, and uh, the con- what the contact most suggested was Noel Rogers, who was the uh, head of United Artists Publishing, and a very nice man. And we, in fact, we be- became good friends and stayed friends for years. In fact, we were even neighbors in the same building. And um, I told him what I'd, I was trying to do, and I'd like to you know, uh, get a gig for a couple of weeks. So he called Dick Rowe at DECA and made an appointment for me. And um, I guess the way I can describe this is that as far as I was concerned, I was going to be there for five weeks only, and that I was therefore going to present myself as a brash American, which is what I expected Dick would be expecting. And I pretty much walked in and said something to the effect of, you know, I'm the best producer since sliced bread was invented. And here's what I just did and gave him the two acetates that they gave me. And um, they listened to him and he said, uh, you start today. <laughs> so, <laughs> Isn't this uh, the same Dick Rowe who was famous for rejecting the Beatles? Yeah, who was famous for it and which is a bad rap. Because he, really? he did not reject, reject the Beatles. He had a situation where he could uh, hire one of two uh, bands. One was the Beatles and the other one was, um, and I can't remember the name, who the hell it was now. And he gave Mike Smith, his senior A&R guy, a producer, the choice of um, choosing one. He took the other one. 50-50 chance there, yeah, huh? Right. <laughs> well, I mean, the chance being, of course, I suppose you can reflect on this, is that if, had he chosen the Beatles, would it have been would it ever have been the Beatles? That's true. That's true. And it would have been a completely different situation yeah. for them. And who oh, knows? Totally, what yeah. And as I said, in, in, in my uh, major fantasy is that I'd arrived in London two months before and had been at that meeting because I would have chosen the Beatles because I heard the... the uh, acetate with the songs they had on it. I said, oh, you know, no, of course I would have chosen them, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. So so you mentioned, you know, sort of walking in there as the brash American. Um, you know, I, I find that interesting because, um, I, I, as I mentioned to you previously, you know, I, um, I went over to Germany for a few years back in the early 90s. And um, one of the things that I found, I, I got signed to a production deal with BMG. And one of the things that I found in working with a lot of the European bands was that I was sort of treated as, you know, somewhat the exotic foreigner, so to speak. And, you know, did, did that play into, you know, your, your, your dynamics with some of the bands you were working with? I, I think that certainly qualifies as 
the same type of situation. I was, if not the first, and I think I was the first American to actually turn up and become a producer. Mm -hmm. um, then, yeah, I was certainly a rarity. Uh, they, the other thing that I did when I walked in doing my brash bit was that um, I told them that, uh, which I found out as I had been uh, looking at the, the UK situation, uh, nobody in England at that point in time, no producer was getting royalties. They were all on a uh, weekly salary. And mm. uh, I knew, I'd heard about Dick and Noel Rogers told me that he was, he was very pro-American. And so uh, I said, uh, Dick, by the way, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you're hiring me. Uh, by the way, I'm an independent producer and I get royalties. And, <laughs> and he said... Talk okay. about brash. <laughs> yeah, he said, okay, that's fine. So, <laughs> so that's, that's how all that worked out. And, um, and I think I was probably or very close to being the first indie producer in uh, the UK. That's yeah, that that's really funny. I mean, you you really sort of forged a lot of new territories, and and in certain ways, just kind of throwing it up against the wall and seeing what would stick, huh? Well, it's because I really didn't care as far as I was going. As far as I knew, I was going back in five weeks. Didn't matter. Uh huh. That's absolutely nothing to lose. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Interesting. So. This was what, um, I guess, early 60s? 1962. 62, okay. So not only was technology a whole lot different, but the whole role of the producer and the, the record industry in general was completely different than it is now. Well, uh, the uh, yes and no. I, I see if I, I can explain quickly. The technology was pretty much the same, which kind of surprised me. But uh, in fact, Bill told me it would be because he had worked at IBC in uh, London for a long time before he came to America. And um, but, however, the technology was almost exactly the same. Uh, what was different that I immediately noticed is what I termed of, and I didn't invent this term that. The music I was listening to was polite. Um, they reserved. Yeah. Uh, they did not bash out stuff like I've been used to already doing in LA. So um, I kind of brought that with me, along with uh, the fact, as I've said on many occasions, I when uh, when when at Conway and on our off time. Uh, Phil was happy for me to experiment with doing things. In fact, he joined in with a lot of the stuff. And uh, I worked out a way how to use a dozen mics on drums, which at that point in time, nobody was doing. There was like you know three, maybe four maximum. Right. Right. And, um, and of course, I have the usual thing. You can't do that because it'll phase. And I said, okay, well, I've done it. So uh, in fact, when I arrived in uh, London, one of the first things I did was with The Bachelors, and uh, I was told all that, you know, it's going to be, I said, okay, well, I'm miking it, you know, watch, you know, and you'll see, you know, like a month later, everybody was, was trying to use 12 mics. So, um, so I brought that with me. I also brought the loudness with me because I didn't want to be polite. Uh, I would get close to the red line on um, on recording and uh, something again I'd been used to doing in LA, so it, it, it was not difficult to do. The equipment being exactly the same, I, could, I knew the extents to which I could go. Well, and and there again we get into the whole left brain right brain thing because you know the the politeness that you speak of was basically sort of accepted technical wisdom of the day you know you don't pin the meters you don't no. you don't exceed certain boundaries of you know not just not just politeness in terms of culture but politeness in terms of you know the the limits of engineering as they were accepted oh, back then and, and, and the deleter of all that was emi uh emi was um for guys that showed up in you know white coats and uh, and were extremely conservative, I think maybe is the nicest word I can use, and how they approached 
uh, recording, and they wouldn't dream of pinning uh, the, the needle back on a, on a meter. Uh, and I think pretty much as they were the gold standard pretty much at that point, at least for labels, and everybody pretty much followed what they were doing. Uh, uh, the uh, the independent suitors like IBC were much more innovative, but they still uh, it's not, it wasn't their fault. Um, the uh, the bands or the artists that were coming in had it in their head they they needed to do polite music. You know that's that's my take on it. That's the way I think that it worked out. Sure, and and this was also the era of. Um... You know, I would say the the Pat Boone era. You know, the era yeah, where was, uh, yeah. there was race music on one side, and then there were the polite versions of that, right. so to speak. So it it kind of makes sense that you know this was a this was not just a a, a technical uh, aspect. This was actually cultural in that sense, uh, to a great degree. And of course, <clears throat> England at that time, much more than now, was considered as a very polite country and people were polite to each other. And um, I think that was kind of the reason why everything else kind of filtered down from that into any, uh, any and all of the businesses that people were involved in. Sure, it makes sense. Now, um, also, you know, not just, not just technically speaking, but I think in general, um, the record industry, culturally speaking, was different than to the role of the producer was a whole lot different than, you know, compared to what it, I don't even want to say what it is now, but even what it is, what it was in the eighties or nineties, as the industry got much bigger. Um, I think as a producer, you were, I think the dynamic was a whole lot different back then. You were in certain sense, a little more in control of things and, um, able to sort of shape the artist a little more than, than, um, then we, that, that we is the way we, that is the way we were doing it here in the states. Sure, so, sure. Uh, exactly. it, it never occurred to me to do it any other way. Yeah, and it makes sense. Now, I know that um, you know, I, I, I've read a lot of stuff about your own production philosophy, and so I, I would love to get into a little bit of a conversation about that because I know that you know the creative process being what it is. You go into the studio with a young artist, and you know, in in those days, most of these artists that you were dealing with were kind of young and inexperienced. Well, as as was I. Exactly, uh, exactly. I, so, how did you how did you adapt to that whole power balance there? Well, I I think I started with the fact that um, okay, two different situations. Uh, number one, I'm a I'm a hands on producer, and I will explain that if I have to. Too. Um, Secondly, it occurred to me that somebody had to captain the ship and I elected myself as the captain. So uh, when I went into a session uh, with, with an artist, uh, 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 everything that was going on, we had talked about before and I was, a, I was very good on rehearsing as opposed to uh, some producers just kind of walked in on the day and you know let it happen, and uh, uh, it, it, the whole thing was being involved with the artists. I have a great respect for musicians, not being a particularly good one myself, and um, I, I loved working with really terrific musicians. And it you know, worked out that I I certainly uh, wound up doing that with a number of the artists I have. So um, as a hands-on producer by which I mean that I was pretty, I was there from inception, um, finding the artist and- uh, A lot of pre-production work with them and whatnot, oh, is what you're saying. Oh, oh totally. I, you know, working with the kind of material that they had been used to doing and maybe changing it if I didn't think it was the right direction, uh, choosing material for them to do. Hopefully that they were writing things that I really thought was, uh, the right kind of things to record in the first place, which of course, or fortunately for me, worked out with both the Who and the Kinks. And, um, and if not, then I had to choose the material and then rehearsed uh, the, the song with them, did the arrangements, uh, got into the studio so we knew what we were doing. I, what I always tried to do, my philosophy, I suppose you would have to call it, is that <clears throat> I try to prepare 
to go into the studio with uh, knowing about 90% of what we were going to do and leaving the other 10 for inspiration. Um, and uh, which often worked out, by the way. And um, uh, that's, that's how I approached the entire thing. And uh, as I said, uh, I had a great respect for really good musicians and the bands I chose, uh, one of the criteria was that they had to be good musicians. And on uh, and the, and the odd time or two when I had a band where one or two were not, I know that I undoubtedly pissed off the band by hiring a, uh, uh, a uh, session guy. But uh, that I felt that was necessary. But I think, you know, I, I think what's interesting to me in the delineation there, you know, you, you talk about being a hands-on producer, which I, I can see your point there, but I think a lot of producers are guilty of, you know, they call it overproduction or whatever you want to call it. But I think, you know, what strikes me is that you weren't only looking for musicians who were good players, but you were looking for a certain characteristic, a certain aspect of their artistic creation that could shine through so that you weren't putting so much of your own stamp on it, but really kind of allowing them to shine oh, through. Oh, no, absolutely. Well, it's again, this goes back to Conway, where uh, one of our major uh, uh, recording that, that came in involved the, um, the the Wrecking Crew. The Wrecking Crew, for anybody who doesn't know, was the kind of elite number of band guys who were pretty much booked for every session because they were the best at their particular instrument. So I had I had a lot of experience with them because a, they were frequent visitors to the studio. And and that's an interesting example right there because you know if you if when I started discovering all of the tracks that the Wrecking Crew had played on, or at least that that revolving crew of musicians, Hal Blaine, Carol Kay, right. et cetera, et cetera, I think you know, discovering that those were all the same musicians, again, they they still managed to sound different enough on each track that you could, <clears throat> that they would allow the artist that they were backing to shine through. Uh, and that's, and I, I found that as the absolute way that every great session musician operated and, and it certainly carried through for me when I got to London and found Jimmy Page and Nicky Hopkins because they were they did exactly the same thing. You have to be sort of chameleon-esque in that sense, don't you? Well, I think flexible is probably a better word. Um, these, these were excellent musicians. They could play anything and they managed to fit, what, fit into whatever uh, particular song they were given. Sure, and that, that also went for you as a producer, no doubt. Oh, uh, absolutely. You know, I, I, it's, I, I approached every song that I recorded as a potential single. That's what I tried to do. So I know that your, your work with The Who only, um, only lasted for, I guess, one or two albums. Um, right. But with a band like The Kinks, for example, you, you saw through a whole lot of artistic development there. And I'm sure that especially Ray Davies, you know, really developed as an artist, both in the studio, um, based on what he was doing with you and on his own personal development. How does the, how did, tell me a little bit about how the dynamic changes as you work with an artist that becomes more and more sure of their own identity. Well, I think the word you're looking for is confidence. So once, you know, once they got in and found, especially after they found that they become a hit band, uh, we're going to speak about the kinks. Um, yeah, things changed a hell of a lot from uh, being pretty much totally unknown to all of a sudden being, uh, you know, uh, flavor of the month. And um, uh, Ray started out being a little bit reticent, which is not his normal way of being. And uh, he, he certainly changed as he went along. And uh, he is, is one of the... the best writers of songs I'd ever encountered, you know, no question. Uh, uh, along with, you know, fortunately, uh, Pete Townsend, you know, and others that I, that I work with. And, um, yeah, he, he kept developing and, and tried different things. And uh, uh, 
yes, the, the first couple of things we did with, you know, really got me and uh, 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 anyhow, you know, was it um, uh, all day and all the night, uh, where we went from bashing it out to um, too tired of waiting, which was was slated at that point for uh, to be on the LP, and I pulled it off the LP uh, and said, "This has got to be the next single." Of course, fortunately, it worked out because it turned out to be number one. And that was really sort of the beginning of a a, a lot more subtlety on their part. I mean, when you start right. to get into like Waterloo Sunset, right. and Lola, you know, recordings like that. Right. I mean, yeah, Sunday did, afternoon, or dynamic kind of thing. Yeah. Did your dynamic with with Ray change as he started um, developing more as an artist? Well, I'm not quite sure how you mean dynamic in this particular definition. <laughs> um, well, but, uh, well, we're talking about the idea of, <laughs> of hands-on, you know, versus letting the artist shine through. As the artist becomes more and more confident, does that change your, or did that change your role as the producer? It didn't change my role. I think it more changed uh, uh, his role. Um, he, I think, pretty much from the get-go felt that he could produce his own stuff, which in the beginning certainly wasn't true. As it developed, he probably could. And um, I think that halfway through my tenure with him, he wasn't as pleased as at the beginning. So uh, our relationship was kind of interesting, to say the least. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I, I think that would be true of almost any artist, you know, as they become, um, you know, a little bit more assertive, so yeah. to speak. You know, they want to produce themselves almost. Right. Oh, I, I think most of them do. Uh, a lot of them never wind up doing it. A lot of them do. <clears throat> Ray certainly wanted to do it. And um, uh, one thing that didn't change the, the entire time I recorded uh, him was that uh, uh, we did have regular sessions of things he wrote, and he was very prolific. And uh, I still would say, uh, yeah, I think that needs some work, and let's put that one aside, and yeah, let's do that now. Uh, so that was pretty consistent throughout. Let's talk a little bit about technology, because that's another thing that obviously evolved along with you and your career. Um, you know, I mean, you started out, I guess, the, I guess the machines you were using when you started out were three track, right? Correct. So we went from three track to four track to eight track, et cetera, et cetera. Um, 24 track, right. Yeah. Now, you know, for example, you talked earlier about the idea of using so many mics on the drums, which, you know, clearly went, it probably dovetailed very nicely into the advent of, you know, more tracks and more available oh, tracks and whatnot. Uh, tons more uh, ability to control the sound, of course. Mm -hmm. So how did that change your creative process? You know, the whole idea of being able to isolate, being able to go back and punch in, being able to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and especially once we got into digital, the idea of being able to undo and not have to worry about razor blades. How do you think the creative process evolved along with that? Uh, let me think about that. Um, I think the creative process was the same. I think the method of getting there obviously changed with the got a lot faster. <laughs> with, yeah, well, with the ability to have uh, that many more tracks um, made it easier and more difficult in some respects. Is you know how do you then divide the tracks up so you have the ultimate control? Because the the bottom line was that you were uh, going for the final mix. Uh, with three track, it was virtually a no brainer. You didn't have to, because uh, you, you had to plan ahead and uh, see how you're going to combine tracks. And then, if there were anything to be done, we, we would, uh, and I often did, uh, go from one three track to another, adding tracks as we went along. That was obviously not the case any longer once we got into you know, many multi tracks. I mean, um, I thought when when we finally got to a track, I thought, wow, this is this is fantastic. And then you know, it wasn't much later we got into twenty four track, and it was a um, a, uh, a a major uh, 
uh, situation of having many too many riches to, to deal with, but you know what, what we managed. <laughs> Paralysis of analysis is what uh, what a lot of people call it, you know. Mm -hmm. But I, but I think it's interesting because for you coming from you know your original approach of having to sort of have it all in your head ahead of time because you only had a limited number of tracks and a limited number of times you could do right. things. Um, I think, you know, bringing that then to the multi-track environment probably, um, probably resulted in a much different approach than people who started out, you know, I mean, I started out with, you know, there were 24 tracks in the studios. I mm -hmm. only had eight tracks, but I knew that that was an option. And I think that probably, you know, that probably changed your attitude in terms of, knowing that you had to conceive a lot of these things right at the beginning. Uh, let's see if I can give you the answer. I'm trying to think of how I thought back about it at that point. Uh, one of the things I think I preface this by saying is that I was always able to do, I thought everybody could and apparently they can, is I could, I've always been able to hear in my head what the finished product should sound like. Uh, That's a gift. And I kind of worked toward that, you know, with certainly leaving space open for changes, but uh, I had a pretty fair preconceived notion of how the thing should wind up. So uh, that certainly helped with three track because uh, I didn't have any other option. Um, when it got to eight track and then eventually the 24 track, I mean, then it was really, really a no brainer. Uh, I would uh, spread my drums probably onto about five or six different tracks, and uh, the luxury, huh? Oh, yeah, it was great. Yeah, <laughs> it was. You know, it was. Uh, uh, it, it also, it was easier in so many ways because, uh, uh, albeit I didn't really like, in many cases, leaving it till the end to do things. I wanted to do it in the, you know, get it done right in the beginning before we got to the end, um, but, uh, and because a lot of producers uh, did actually do that, that they, uh, they, they liberally, uh, or maybe there's a better word than that, um, use tracks because they had, they could use the tracks and not really thinking about how they were gonna combine them in the end. And uh, I, I, I think, well, anyways, I, that was my technical part, I guess. I always thought about how I was actually going to stick it all together in the end. Yeah, and that, it makes sense. I think, you know, it, it, in a certain way, it probably put you at a, a distinct advantage there because you were envisioning a lot of things and you could be more economical with those tracks. And also you... You didn't have to think so much in terms of uh, mix down because you had laid a lot of it out in advance. Uh, well, this is certainly what I tried to do, yes. And, and usually it worked, not always, but, you know, usually it did work. Mm -hmm. I look at that now and I think, you know, um, at this point when we have unlimited tracks, mm -hmm. um, as I say, you know, we, we end up overanalyzing a lot of it and trying far too many different things and then, you know, hitting undo and going back and all of those things. And I think that's... Well, that's, that's, that's certainly cool. true is that uh, in many ways, digital has created opportunities for some producers to do exactly what you just said and keep trying things instead of having some kind of idea of how they wanted it done in the first place. So, uh, and, and I think also to be fair, a lot of this probably started back in the analog area when of course originally uh, when we were recording back in the sixties and seventies, the idea was that if you were a really good band, you didn't spend a huge amount of time because you knew what you were doing. And consequently, it was it was not a big deal uh, to finish off four tracks in a three hour session. And then of course they did a total 180 and uh, in the later of, of mainly, I guess, starting in the seventies, uh, where the, more the most time you spent, the, the better off you were considered which is really a, a bad way to look at it. <laughs> uh, I think digital has kind of got a combination of that. 
It's true. It's true. I mean, I, you know, there are things I absolutely love about digital. I mean, you know, having the ability to have this virtual gear that, you know, years ago we would have given, a, given an arm just to have half of, you know, that's definitely a, a, an aspect of it. But at the same time, I think you're right. I think the, the trade-off is we spend a lot less time in pre-production, a lot less time nurturing the artist and, and really kind of working on the product before we get into the studio. Well, I think that some do. I haven't changed. I'm still uh, very old school when it comes to uh, before I, uh, I walk into the studio, I want to know what I'm doing. I want to know what the artist is doing and uh, uh, to, to just wind up and sit around and chew gum while your people are deciding is really not where I'm at. Well, and I also think, you know, part of that pre-production process is it, it, it's also about forming a relationship and forming a certain trust with the artist and getting to know them and getting to know each other. And I think, you know, that especially when you talk about the idea that the producer was really the boss, quote unquote, right. you No, know, I think the artist has to have a certain amount of trust in you if you're going to get that performance out of them. I, well, I think that's, yeah, that, that should be a given. It is it, it is a situation no. in a lot, of, a lot of cases. I'm not sure it is in all cases, but... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and that's, I think, you know, we could, we could lament forever about how the industry has changed, but I think that is an aspect that, you know, really was a big part of production in those days where, you know, you talked about the idea of, of, you know, having 90% of it sketched out and leaving 10% of it to chance. That 10%, I think was critical of the idea of just knowing that you could go in and kind of capture a certain magic. I, I, that's what I always hoped for. It's why I always allowed, always allowed for it because uh, things happen uh, serendipitously that um, uh, that you want to, you want to keep in, and um, it, I, I think that anybody walking in with with uh, anything other than that kind of a notion is is uh, cheating themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with you. Now, I think, um, you know, part of what you were doing in those days was really kind of pushing not only the the um, not only the boundaries of production, but also, as you said, a lot of the uh, studio tricks and everything like that, you know, using a lot of mics on a drum kit, um, overdriving, things like that. Was that was that part of this just the whole brash American thing? <laughs> You know, I had no idea what they were doing in England at the time I was I was experimenting with all this. So it doesn't enter into it from my point of view. I was just at a, at a point where I realized that there had a revolution had started and we were breaking new ground. So consequently, there were no limits as far as I, uh, as I was concerned. Um, I was um, uh, there working on stuff. I thought uh, if I can devise better ways or at least different ways to do things, then that's what I should be doing. So that's why I also, I always did that. And the other point, by the way, about the industry changing, you know, one of the major changes in the industry back in the 60s, practically every exec working for a label was a music guy. The total opposite exists today, unfortunately. Yeah, that's true. That's true. And I think that sort of gave you, uh, I mean, you know, as you say, a lot of it was just really good timing. You were there at the right time where right. all these boundaries were being uh, No pushed. question. I went out, I got to London at the right time. I yeah, you did. your luck. You did. And then the, the idea of being able to be that quote unquote brash American and help to push some of those boundaries, I think, you know, you really, you, you contributed a lot to the development of what the music industry became after that point. Well, thank you for that. I, I don't think I ever pictured myself in that role, but if that's what I did, I guess that's what I did. Oh, I would think so. I would think, you know, that the, the idea of, you know, as you say, by the time you left England, you know, the engineers weren't walking around in white coats and, and saying oh, yeah. like no, they except, were. Except for EMI. <laughs> <laughs> This is true. Yes. Um, so tell me about some of your other, you know, your your own bag of tricks. I mean, obviously, you know, lots of mics on the drums. That was a big thing. And you kind of impacted a lot of um, 
a lot of other engineers with stuff like that. Did you do any other? Oh yeah, one of the like one, one of the other major things that Phil and I worked on was separation, which at that point in time was was not a big in the early six. It was not a, a big deal, but uh, we thought it was a big deal, um, and we worked a lot on how to uh, do a really good separation on the instruments so that uh, we'd have as much control as we could already, given the fact that we're um, working with uh, primitive gear. <laughs> so. Yeah, at that point, I was going to say you, you, you probably were dependent a lot on microphone directionality and gobos, right? Yeah. I, I know, you know, you mentioned you came up in Conway, which is one of one of the oldest studios in L.A. Yeah. Um, who were some of your mentors coming up? Well, Phil was, was my main mentor. I mean, in fact, my only mentor. Um, he, he was great. He was an excellent engineer. He, he wound up doing a lot of uh, uh, film score mixing and all that kind of stuff. He was, he was an excellent engineer. And he was certainly one, one of the lead engineers when he was at IBC. And then for you, a lot of it was obviously kind of learning on the job and trial by fire when you when you got to the UK then, huh? Uh, well, before I got... Oh, even before you got there, yeah. No, I, I've, I've been uh, at Conway long enough to know what I was... Uh, to figure out what I was supposed to be doing and how and how to do it. So you know, I, when I actually got to England, I actually knew what I was doing. When did you come back to the U.S.? 1979. Okay, so so there was a, there was a bit of uh, bit of revolution still going on in the music industry here at that point too. There, there was, and I <clears throat> excuse me. Now I suppose I should add that, or I should say that, so, somewhere in the 70s, I got I really started getting bored, and um, I had not realized. In fact, I hadn't realized until I got back here how much work I had done and how many hours and days I spent in studios. Um, so I just tailed off in the mid seventies. And uh, by the time I, I, I got back here, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't even interested. I was doing other things. I was seeing about investments and, um, and doing other things. I had, I had a book publishing company. I did a whole bunch of other things. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, it, it took many years for me to get back to where I, I got interested again. Was it because of the industry itself and what where it was going, or was it more your own personal interest? You no, know, I think personal. I, I think uh, the industry, the industry as it as it exists now, is certainly not what I think of as a music biz because, I'm, I'm fortunately. And I'll probably get uh, hanged for this, but I don't care. Uh, I think a lot of the music, uh, so-called music today, is garbage. Um, and uh, I'm sorry that it's reached that point. There, are, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. As far as I'm concerned, that music has started to come back around. Um, if it ever comes back around totally, I'll be surprised. But at least it's making inroads. There, you know, the 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 organic approach is at least returning to a certain extent. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that's uh, you know that that's interesting to me to see that uh, you know you're you're still very very conscious of that because yeah that's you know that's been one of the big complaints that music has gotten so corporate and that really artists don't have a chance to be to to develop in that sense, the way you were able to develop artists. No, I think that's true, and uh, it's, I think that's unfortunate. I, the other thing that's happened, which uh, as, as a hands-on producer doesn't particularly enamor me, and that is uh, that there are some so-called producers who uh, check in about a half hour a week, and, um, and are the, the producers, which not in my book they're not, but uh, that's that's happened in the last uh, 15, 20 years, and uh, yes. I think that's unfortunate. Production by committee is, is, I believe, what we call it now. Well, I'm not even sure it's by committee. It's by, uh, uh, I don't want to be here. I'm leaving it to my engineer. <laughs> yeah, this is true. So um, tell me about, what was your most challenging project? 
Oh God, I don't think I've ever been asked that. Let me think. Um, probably the most challenging project is the one I walked out of. Uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the damn band. It was an American band and they turned out to be, as far as I'm concerned, really jerks. And uh, so I just, I walked out, left it. I had an assistant, left up just to him. <laughs> so, so it was mainly a personality thing more than anything else. Well, hey, well the music sucked also, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> and you really feel, Shel. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, and, and, you know, I could see that because, you know, if you're not, if you're doing a whole lot of work like that and you really, there's no appreciation for what you're doing, then what's the point of being there, well, right? There was, there was none in this case and they were uh, uh, obnoxious along with us. So I thought, you know, uh, I, don't have, I don't have to hang out here. It's not my thing. So <laughs> I'm not going to hang out with these brash Americans. <laughs> well, no, I'm, uh, Knowing what brash is all about, these people were, were not brash. They were obnoxious. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know you've got so many things that you've done that were really, you know, timeless and still around. Um, I know one of my personal favorites is, uh, you know, the, the Easy Beats cut. But um, what's what what cut? What would you say is the project that you're most proud of? Uh, <clears throat> well, I'm, and to be conventional, I'm I'm very proud of all the, the major hits I had because. Um, I, uh, I had a major hand in all of them. And um, the fact that they're still as relevant today as when we did it all those years ago is, uh, uh, makes me feel extremely good. I mean, these things I think possibly will last forever. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I know that, you know, uh, not only are they culturally landmarks, but also I think a lot of your recording techniques, as you say, mm -hmm you know, kind of got, kind of became almost mainstream current wisdom, you know? Well, it's, I, you know, something I, I, you know, probably a lot more about than I do. I, I just, I know that I did what I did. And uh, if people listened and heard things that they wanted to uh, copy or use, and it was fine with me, I had no problem with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I, I guess, you know, I was going to ask you one more wrap up question, but I think you've sort of addressed it. Um, mm -hmm. My question was going to be what kind of advice you would give people, you know, young kids coming into the industry now, but um, I'm not sure you would recommend that they even get into the industry now, would you? No, I, I no, I certainly wouldn't even dream of saying that. If they're, if they're passionate about being in the industry, that they should be in the industry. But the best advice I can give them is to, not listen to anybody telling them what they're supposed to be doing. Do what you do. If it's good enough, you'll get there. If it isn't, you won't. And you might uh, just forge a whole new recording technique in the process, right? <laughs> and certainly <laughs> could do that. Um, I, 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 the, uh, the other major advice that I, I would give and have given is that uh, it's extremely important to know your own limitations. A lot of uh, a lot of people don't, certainly a lot of recording artists don't, and that has been the undoing of a lot of them. So uh, if you know what you can do well, do it, uh, and don't try and do something you can't do well. Well, and if you if you can't do it well, figure out, figure out who can and bring them onto the team, so to speak, right? Well, if, if, if there's a way to do that, uh, absolutely. You know, but I'm, I'm even more basic than that. If uh, you are an allegedly a singer and you're not a very good singer, you honestly should know your limitations. Uh, just because you've been told all your life how great you are by your parents and your pals is not uh, any reason to uh, foist your not very good voice on the public. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know, there are certain singers who for example, don't have a great range, but they have an amazing character to their voice. And if they learn to work within those limitations. Yeah, that, that's true. Uh, the, uh, of course, there's the other thing. You just brought up another interesting point here. <clears throat> uh, and I, I've said this in print. Uh, also, I think there are a number of artists who shall remain nameless because I think we know who they are that uh, uh, thank their whatever God they worship every night for Melodyne. 
because um, Melodyne, for people who don't know, is the pitch correction software, which is kind of the gold standard and it's really brilliant. And uh, uh, pretty much with Melodyne, you could make an ape sound like uh, Elvis Presley. You know, uh, uh, and there's, a, uh, there's several artists who unfortunately fall into that category. Uh, they don't do a lot of uh, live gigs because they really can't do a lot of live gigs. Um, and uh, listening to somebody who is consistently off key really gives me internal pain. <laughs> like fingernails on a blackboard, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, very good talent out there. And, um, and uh, in many cases, it's a shame that uh, they go, they continue to go unrecognized. It's got to be uh, uh, very depressing. Uh, it's true. You know, we can talk about microphones and equipment forever, but I think the key to a lot of it really is stuff a little bit deeper than that. And that's, that's territory that you are very, very familiar with. So I appreciate the insight and I'm sure that a lot of uh, younger people in, in particular will appreciate it as well. Well, good. I hope so. It would be, um, be nice if, um, if people could uh, learn something from whomever they're trying to learn something from. Uh, very nice. Well, Shell, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure to actually chat with you and yeah. you know get some of your insights. It's really fun, man. Good. I'm, I'm delighted that you feel that way. That's great. And uh, whatever. I'm happy to speak to you any other time.